Welcome to the Oasis. We're glad you're worshiping with us today. And we want you to know, if, this, if you're newer with us, that this is a place where it's okay to not be okay. Easter, April 8th. Make sure that invite your friends, invite family. It's an opportunity where people every year kind of like God knocks on the door of their heart and they're ready to go to worship somewhere. Sometimes people don't know where to go. They don't even know when Easter is exactly, but it's April 8th. Do that invite. After April 8th, we're going to have our pictorial directory at the end of April, and I think registration begins today. And this is a great opportunity, if you've not seen somebody in a while, too, to say, hey, come in and get your free 8 by 10 And uh, there's no pressure on, on getting packages. That's one of the things with a directory that, you, you know, you want to test and make sure that doesn't happen. So make sure you can invite people back to get a free 8 by 10 to do that. And in May, Dave Ramsey is our second semester of our Connect Groups. And Dave Ramsey's Financial Peace University is going to be an opportunity where we can learn about God's ways on, on finances. I know there are a lot of people in financial difficulties, and this is a great opportunity to do that for each family. It does have a cost where you sign up to Dave Ramsey for life, and it's usually $100. We actually have an opportunity to get people registered at least by the end of the month for $80 per family. It's a lifetime membership. I know it's costly, but we've tried to reduce that cost as best we can so we can do an early bird for 20 bucks off and uh, be able to manage that. But we'd love to have everybody participate in that and uh, have a great time to do that. And you can also register today to win a free one. So if you pay 80 bucks and you win a free one, well, we'll change that out for a small fee. No, no, no exchange fee or anything. <laughs> when you came in, there was a card on, your, on, your, on the chairs. Uh, this is our missionary that we're supporting, the Gray family, founding pastor of the church here, going to New Zealand to plant churches, uh, want to be in prayer for their 90-day journey from here to there, and there's a list of prayer needs on the back. Uh, get to know them, follow them, follow their blog, and uh, stay in touch with that. We started a new series last week called The View, where we're talking about our views about the church. Why is the church important? Where do we get our authority? Last week we talked about the church, that we're an evangelical church, and, uh, and why we are that, that we take as a source of scripture uh, our authority. Some, some churches go by human reason or philosophy. Others go by just the tradition in the churches, but we go by the Bible and try to stick with the Bible alone. So before we get into today's message, the second one, let's go to God with a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for giving us the truth in Scripture, the way to salvation, the way to an abundant life, even in sometimes of this darkened world in which we live, that you can give us hope, that you can give us a life of fellowship and the church and the service that gives our life purpose. I pray, Father, today that your words would touch our hearts, that you would lead us in the way that we would hear the message that you would have us to hear today. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. What a person believes is so extremely important. I mean, what you believe is going to affect how you think and feel and behave. And the same is true spiritually. What you think about the Bible, what you think about the church, what you think about heaven and hell will affect everything that you do. That's why the Bible teaches that coming to God, in order to do that, it requires a right belief. Last week, we talked about being an evangelical church. Today, we're going to look at our view about the Bible. Theologian Karl Barth was once asked, what's the greatest truth that you've ever learned in all your theological learnings throughout life? And he said, you know, and he thought about it. He said, the greatest truth I ever loved is that Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. But not everybody agrees with that. People don't believe in the Bible. In fact, I, I pulled an editorial out of the Lexington paper back, back in Kentucky a while back, and the editorial writer wrote this. It was actually entitled, Christianity is a Cult. And it said, Christians have as their personal guru a man who they claim was born a virgin, fathered by a ghost, rose from the dead, and they look to him to return one day. Maybe he'll come down and play with you and me and Alice and the Easter Bunny. 
And he went on to say, they believe in miracles and prophecies and all sorts of superstitious nonsense. Yes, Virginia, this is really Alice's Wonderland. I'd say that guy kind of rejects the Bible as any authority on his life. And I think the world today, America especially, is kind of divided between this, the people that believe, well, the Bible is truth, and the Bible's not truth, and they seek truth elsewhere. So today in this lesson that I'm teaching on, I'm kind of the teaching pastor today, I want to detail why Christians believe in this book, the Bible, and why we can confidently trust in what it says. First, I want to begin with some Bible trivia. Just some basic Bible facts. I think over time we need to review the facts. There are some people that really aren't even aware of the facts anyway. A Gallup poll asked Christians some basic questions about the Bible. Gallup illustrated the illiteracy of uh, Bible knowledge in our, in our country today. 60% of those polled could not name four go- all four Gospels. 58% could not name half the Ten Commandments. 58% did not know who delivered the Sermon on the Mount. And I think Gallup illustrated that the majority of Americans, a majority of Christians, this is a Christian group, by the way, don't know the basics about the Bible. So we're going to go over some of that. The Bible is a library of 66 books compiled by about 40 different authors over a period of 1,500 years, ranging from about 1,400 B.C. to 100 A.D., Now, can you imagine a book of medicine being written over the past 1,500 years? I mean, we'd have bloodletting to blood transfusions. Or maybe a book of science written over the past 1,500 years. We'd have the world flat. No, world round. But the Bible was composed over a 1,500-year period. And there's this consistency about it, this accuracy about it. And the Bible touches on scientific, historical, and geographical truths And it has enduring credibility in all those areas. And its main theme is Jesus. Its main theme is Jesus. You know, you go into a library, you don't pick up the first book that you come to off the shelf. And if you're not that familiar with the Bible, I wouldn't suggest just reading anything in it. I mean, I would suggest reading one of the first four books of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the Gospels. That tells you and familiarizes yourself with the life of Christ. And then go on to the book of Acts which is a history of the church, why we meet, why we worship, why we study, the purpose for that. We read about that, and then we go into the epistles or the letters to the churches on how to live a Christian life. So there is maybe a profitable way to jump into that if you're reading. So this, this Bible is a library of 66 books, and it's divided into two main sections, the Old Testament and the New Testament. 66 books... Two main sections. There's 39 books in the Old Testament and 27 in the New. Now, we're going to test you on this uh, next week. But here's a good way to remember that. And uh, there's a lot of kind of nuances to that. But there's 39 in the Old Testament. And what's, what's three times nine? 27. There's 27 books in the New Testament. And if you ever forget 39, you can add that. 9 plus 3 is 12. There's 12 apostles. There's all kinds of little uh, devices where you can kind of remember. There's 39 books in the old, 27 in the new, (coughs) and uh, there's 66 books altogether. And you might say, why the Old Testament and why the new? Why are there two main sections? It's a good question. The Old Testament was compiled many years ago by the time Jesus came about. And the Jewish people followed it. The Ten Commandments are there. It's rules and regulations on how to worship God, how to find God. Uh, But God nailed the Old Testament to the cross, so to speak, when he brought about the New Covenant. And and it's it's a new way. we're We're called a New Testament church because we follow, for faith and practice, the New Testament. Paul Harvey once said, he used to listen to Paul Harvey all the time, the Old Testament taught us about God, but Jesus Christ came to lead us to God. And I think that's kind of neat. But Colossians, the Bible says this in Colossians 2, God canceled the written code with its regulations that was against us, that stood opposed to us. He took it away, nailing it to the cross. Hebrews 8 says, by calling this covenant new, or this New Testament new, he's made the first one obsolete. And I mean, it's valuable to read the Old Testament. It has so much application, so much history. But we get our authority on faith and practice from the New Testament. So, The Old Testament and New Testament together is God's final word 
and authority presented to mankind. Nothing new was to ever be produced after that. The Bible itself claims to be God's holy word to mankind. Second Timothy says, All scriptures God breathe and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And God directed those 40 or so Bible writers through, through the Holy Spirit over that period of 1,500 years and enabled them to accurately record and write down God's will for mankind. And 2,000 years later, it is still guiding us to God and revealing to us God's will to us. And listen to this unique warning at the end of the book of the last book of the Bible, the book of Revelation, chapter 22. I warn everyone who hears the words of the prophecy of this book, if anyone adds anything to them, God will add to him the plagues described in this book. And if anyone takes words away from this book of prophecy, God will take away from him his share in the tree of life and in the holy city, which are described in this book. God warns us and wants us to learn exactly what's contained in this book for faith and practice. So that's just kind of some Bible trivia, some Bible basics. Now let's talk about the Bible canon. Some people ask, what is the canon of Scripture? Canon simply means rule or measuring stick. And uh, people often say, well, how did we get the Bible as we know it today? How did it come into existence? We got this Old New Testament. How did it happen? Well, it was compiled with specific rules in mind. That's why we have the 39 books of the Old Testament and the 27 books of the New Testament. The Old Testament basically was authenticated by Jesus. There's more to the canon than simply what I'm going to present today. But Jesus quoted from various Old Testament books. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Deuteronomy, and he referred to them as Scripture or as the Law of Moses. He quoted from Psalms and Isaiah and Micah, referred to them as Scripture. In Luke, it says, beginning with Moses and all the prophets, Jesus explained to them what was said in all the Scriptures concerning himself. So Jesus affirmed the Old Testament as authoritative Scripture when he walked on this earth. Now, the New Testament was authenticated by the church fathers. Well, who are the church fathers? They were a group of people who wrote extensively about the early church. The last book of the Bible, Revelation, was compiled by the Apostle John, written by him in about 98 A.D. And from that period forward, there were people who protected and wrote extensively about the church. And we have a lot of writings, and we refer to them as the church fathers or the early church fathers uh, by that time. Uh, when John wrote in 98 A.D., most of the po other apostles, we presume, were dead at that time. So the church was careful about preserving its history. And they did a lot of writing beyond 100 A.D. And when, when people ask, how do we know that this New Testament is all that we need? Well, we, knew, we know that the church fathers used specific measuring tools to compile the New Testament. It was probably compiled well before 150 A.D. There's different speculation on that. But the books included in our New Testament were either written by an apostle or a close associate of an apostle. Mark was a close associate of Peter, and Luke was a close associate of Paul. And those living in the first century and in the early second century recognized the 27 books of the New Testament as the New Testament. It was first-hand information to those people, and it was canonized, and that's why we have it still today. Secondly, the books must be doctrinally consistent with other writings. There are a lot of other writings other than the New Testament that are contemporary or written in that first century, within 100 years, 50 years of the time that Christ uh, was alive. And some of those claim to be written by an apostle or an associate, but they weren't included in the canon. Why? They weren't included because they were not doctrinally consistent with the New Testament and that rule, that measuring stick that they used to compile the scriptures. For example, the Catholic Bible is a little bit different than, than our Bible that we use. The Catholic Bible between the Old and New Testament 
has the apocryphal writings, the apocrypha. 14 books that they use, that they include, that, that were not included and accepted in the early canon. And, but, but they are in there because they were disregarded because they didn't fit doctrinally. They were doctrinally inconsistent, uh, so they weren't included. But I would challenge you uh, to especially become familiar with the New Testament books because it is good for our faith and practice. It's where we get our authority. I mean, a soldier in boot camp learns to disassemble and assemble his weapon blindfolded, and we should be very familiar with Scripture, which is described as our spiritual weapon. And it's called the sword of the Spirit. So familiarize yourself with the Bible. Thirdly, let's look at Bible reliability. Bible reliability. Josh McDowell, in his book, More Than a Carpenter, illustrates that there are certain criteria to determine whether an ancient document or any document is reliable or not. And one of the, the ways that you prove a document is through internal tests. And uh, the internal test tests a book's content. And the Bible shows that it's reliable with its content. Uh, internally, really, three ways. One is its prophecies are fulfilled. Ecclesiastes 8, 7 says, No man knows the future. And we know that, don't we? I mean, the weatherman, we... He can't really predict whether it's going to snow or not all the time, or rain, or whether it's going to be windy. And even the prognosticators can't tell you 100% sure that Kentucky is going to win the NCAA championship. But because man doesn't know the future, and uh, who knows, maybe Indiana would be in there too. And uh, but but God knows the future, doesn't He? Isaiah says, God said, I make known the end from the beginning, from ancient times. What is still to come? And there are all kinds of prophecies in the Old Testament, over, well over 300 of Jesus alone, uh, written hundreds of years before Jesus walked the face of this earth. So there are all these prophecies. There's a Messiah going to come. He's going to be born of a virgin. He's going to be betrayed by a fam, friend by 30 pieces of silver. He's going to die between two thieves. They're going to cast lots for his garment. They're going to be buried in a borrowed tomb. He would rise from the dead. Dozens and dozens of prophecies that were fulfilled in Jesus. And I love this illustration. It's a classic from mathematician and computer whiz, this guy Peter Stoner from Pasadena Community College. He did these calculations, and he said for only eight, for only eight of the prophecies, and there were hundreds, for only eight to come true in the person of Jesus Christ. The odds are this, 1 in 10 to the 157th power. Now that's huge. And he illustrates that. He says, you know how big a number that is? He said, imagine the state of Texas covered two feet in silver dollars. And a guy parachutes in, and he's blindfolded. And he lands in the state of Texas two feet deep in these silver dollars. And one of them's marked with an X, one of them. And he reaches down, blindfolded, and he picks one up. If he picked up that one with the X, that's the odds of Jesus randomly fulfilling eight prophecies. That's how solid its prophecies are. Second Peter says this, For prophecy never had its origin in the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. George Mark Elliott was a professor where... Uh, I later went to Bible college, and he said the Bible just doesn't read like a lie. And it doesn't, but its prophecies were fulfilled, and its purposes are accomplished. Isaiah reads this, My word that goes out from my mouth, it will not return to me empty, but will accomplish what I desire and achieve, the purpose for which I sent it. There's something about this book that still changes lives even 2,000 years after the New Testament was written. What is it about this book? What changes a person's life from living without purpose to living a purpose-driven life? 2,000 years old. It's because of this. Hebrews 4.12 says, the word is living and active. It's an alive book. It's what we call a living document. I mean, haven't you ever come to church sometimes and you think, man, has the preacher got my house bugged? God's got your house bugged. 
He knows. And sometimes you can come in here and I don't want to go to church today. I'm not, up on, I'm not up on faith today. And you walk out and you think, I've got a vision of God today. And your life just seems a little lighter, a little more exciting, a little more endurable that I want to get beyond this. It's because God's Word is living and active. And it penetrates our very soul, our very being, and our mind, and our hearts. And its facts are accurate. It's purposeful. Its prophecies are fulfilled. And its facts are accurate, too. When you examine the Bible, it is overwhelming of all the information in there and its accuracy. And there are some people out there, have you ever heard them say, well, the Bible contradicts itself. Well, there aren't that many supposed contradictions in Scripture. And with a little investigation, it's kind of easy to find out what people are talking about. One of the examples is this uh, from Matthew 25 or 27. It says, Judas threw the money into the temple and left. Then he went away and hanged himself. That's in Matthew. Now, the book of Acts says this. With the reward that he got, talking about Judas, for his wickedness, Judas bought a field. There he fell headlong, and his body burst open, and all his intestines spilled out. And people say, well, you know what? Did, you, did Judas hang himself, or did he jump off a cliff? Well, both can really be true. They can be harmonized. I mean, he could have hung himself in a remote area, and through decay, his Bible, their body eventually fell and smashed down on the rocks and just kind of burst open at that time. So both can be true. The texts don't necessarily contradict. They kind of add a more complete picture. They come at it from a different angle. And here's an important point. When somebody says, oh, there, there's contradictions in the Bible. When somebody says that, they're probably just repeating something that they've heard and they probably really don't know what they're really, uh, what the contradiction is that they're talking about. But ask them. If you hear something, well, it's full of contradiction, ask them. Say, hey, if, say you're the judge in court. And three people come in to testify about something. And when they sit down on the stand, they roll out verbatim, one after another, the exact same message. What would you conclude if somebody had every fact, every detail the same? You conclude, well, I think they talked about that. I think they kind of worked their story out, got it straight a little bit. But Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John were witnesses of Christ. And they tell the story of Christ from a little bit different angle. And I think it only adds to emphasize the accuracy of it. They're not just telling the same story. They're relating it to how the Holy Spirit's guided them using their memory. But those are the internal tests, that its prophecies are true, that its purposes are accomplished. And then there are, there are external tests, external tests that reveal the Bible's reliability. There's been historical verification. There are historians that are outside of the Bible that existed in the time of about the first century. Uh, there was a guy by the name of Flavius Josephus who wrote in the Jewish Antiquities referring to Jesus and James being brought before the Sanhedrin. He was born in 37 AD. There's Tacitus in AD 112 who referred to Jesus uh, being put to death by Pontius Pilate. There are several references of early historians that are extra-biblical texts, extra-biblical historians that write about uh, the first century and the church and Jesus. There's archaeological verification uh, that, that verifies uh, uh, Scripture. The U U.S. News World Report had... Uh, an article that said there's this wave of archaeological discovery affirming that the Bible's more historically accurate than ever before. And all the time there's this archaeological evidence being unearthed and pulled up from the ground. And, uh, you know, one in the past several years has been Sodom and Gomorrah. They found that, you know, these credible archaeologists, you know, this, these cities were destroyed by fire and just lending more confirmation, affirmation that the Bible is true. Then there's manuscript verification there, there, there's so much manuscript evidence, over 20,000 ancient manuscripts or fragments of manuscripts dating all the way back with just within years of Jesus when he walked on the face of this earth. Evidence for the authenticity of the New Testament. And uh, you think about the contrast. I mean, we accept some old books as authentic 
And there's really no evidence to do that, but the Bible is so substantiated by all of these manuscripts. But you know what the internal tests and external tests tell me? There are people a lot more smarter than I'll ever be that have done the research. They're a lot smarter than the guy that did the editorial that said this is Alice's Wonderland, that have done the research, that have done the study, that have reached the conclusion that the Bible is reliable. Jesus said in Matthew 5, until the heaven and earth disappear, not the smallest letter, jot and tittle, not the least stroke of a pen, will by any means disappear from the law until everything is accomplished. He said, I'm going to preserve it. And he has. And fourthly, let's look at Bible translations and consider that. You know, people ask, what translation's the best? What translation do you use primarily? Well, the original manuscripts, the Old Testament written in Hebrew, New Testament in Greek, some Aramaic, you know, throughout as well. And there are some good translations today. But they are just that. They are English translations of the original texts. But there are a lot of, of good translations. I read primarily from the New International Version, the, the NIV. But there are some things that are helpful, I think, in considering your choice when you choose what version or translation of the Bible that you're going to use. And one has to do with accuracy. In choosing a good translation, it's important to have something that's translated from the original language very well and very accurate. And uh, most reliable translations are translated through a panel of scholars. It's difficult for any one person to translate all those old documents from the Hebrew and Greek alone without some of their biases entering, entering into the picture. And what I mean by a bias is you know, a person will tend to put in what they think is right because they have this preconceived notion. And, uh, you know, we see biases all the time, probably in the news media. You know, you watch different news outlets and they're talking about the same set of facts. And it's like, how can they be so different? How can they be so slanted? It's because they've got this bias that they're working from. I mean, I heard last week... And it's kind of reported like this, that, that the United States just has about 30% of the, the world's oil underneath the United States of America. And then it said, well, America uses 25% of the world's oil, period. And the conclusion was, how in the world could we ever drill up enough oil to reach that 25%? We only have 3%. Well, they kind of led you to that. Now, there's a difference, I think, between media bias and media manipulation. Uh, but you got to be aware of that. And that comes through in Bible translations as well. A, a, a bias will enter in. And it's good to use a translation that's been particularly translated from a panel. I mean, think about the difference between a translation and a paraphrase. A translation of the Bible looks at the old language and tries to present sometimes even the the the, the way that the sentence structure is given and the original intent of that. Now, that's a translation. It attempts to say what the Bible says and how it said it. But it paraphrases that. It paraphrases and kind of says what we would assume the Bible means. And it can have that bias. The NIV, which I used, uh, was first completed in 1978. It was the first translation of the Scriptures that started outselling beyond the King James Version and its popularity years ago. But Lewis Foster, Dr. Lewis Foster, was a professor where I got my master's and did my education in Cincinnati. And he was one that was on this panel of scholars. And he said, we agonized over every phrase. And every phrase of Scripture had to be filtered down through three committees. And they agonized over making that an accurate translation. The King James Version is an older version, 1611, when it was completed, primarily by one guy. It has a few biases. It's pretty, pretty sound, theologically speaking, and very popular. But it uses an old language that's kind of difficult to, to, to adapt to. In 1971, 
Uh, for example, the Living Bible, it's a paraphrase. That's why I throw that in there. It used to be a popular paraphrase. Kenneth Taylor would read to his kids at night out of the Bible, and they didn't understand it. So he started kind of translating a paragraph or two when he was on the train going home. He'd read it to his kids, and he eventually did the entire scriptures, and they produced that. But it's a paraphrase, so it's not going to have the accuracy. And it's okay to read a paraphrase or living Bible as long as you know that it's, uh, it's a paraphrase. I mean, think of this example. The King James Version Bible reads this uh, in chapter 20 of uh, 1 Kings. This is the King James. Let not him that girdeth on his harness boast himself as he that putteth it off. You know, and what it means is don't boast about the battle that you've won it before you go through the battle, kind of. And this is how the Living Bible paraphrases that in 1 Kings 20. Don't count your chickens before, hatch, before, <laughs> before they hatch. Now, can you see somebody picking up the Living Bible? And they're reading that phrase, don't count your chickens before they hatch. And they're going, I've always heard that phrase. I wonder where that came from. It came out of the Bible. <laughs> well, no, it didn't come out of the Bible. That was somebody's later usage of that phrase. But it's a paraphrase. So accuracy is something that a person should consider in, in, in using what translation they'd want to use. Clarity is another consideration in choosing uh, the Bible. In, in the New Testament days, they spoke Greek. And the Koine Greek was the people's language. It was spoken on the street. Classical Greek was used in the courts by lawyers and attorneys. God saw to it that the Koine Greek, the people's language, was used in the New Testament because people could understand that. And when you're choosing uh, some scriptures, choose something that you can understand, that has that clarity. I mean, just sticking with the King James Version, because of its popularity. It was completed in 1611, and uh, that was a long time ago. I mean, really. And it, it's, it's solid translation. I like using it at times, like in Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want him, make him lie down. I love using that. It has poetic, beautiful language. But why did we stop using the King James Version? I mean, why, were, why why didn't we just, hey, that's good enough for me? It's because there's other vernacular, there's other grammar that's easier to understand. Uh, there's newer language since 1611. And thou dost thinkest that we should have a, a, new, a newer uh, translation, doesn't thou thinkest that also? I mean, isn't that hard? You ever watch one of those movies that has that language? It's just hard to follow. But think of this example. In Mark 14, King James, it says, Suffer the little children to come after me. Suffer? Well, 400 years ago, suffer meant permit. And, you know, you've got to kind of know those things when, you, when you're reading the, the King James. Isaiah 14, look at this comparison of the King James. says, I will also make it a possession for the bitter in pools of water, and I will sweep it with the besom of destruction, saith the Lord of hosts. What's bitter? What's besom? Now, here's the NIV. Look at it in comparison. I will turn her into place of owls, and into swampland. I will sweep her with the broom of destruction, declares the Lord Almighty. Quite different in definitions. Look at 2 Thessalonians in the King James Version. For the mystery of iniquity doth already work. Only he who now letteth will let until he be taken out of the way. Letteth will let? Well, what's that mean? Back then, to letteth meant to prevent and today, to let would mean just the opposite, to permit. So in the NIV, it says the secret power of lawlessness is already at work. But the one who now holds back will continue to do so till he is taken out of the way. But there's many solid translations today that are accurate, that have clarity. And you know what's most important is that a person reads it, no matter the translation, that you're picking up the Bible and you're reading it, you can compare it, you can study it, you can have several translation and paraphrases to understand what it means, but read it. George Barna did a survey. 80% of American people believe that the Bible is the most influential book of all time. 80%, but 45% say they rarely or never read it. 
Only one out of six people in America today read the Bible, according to George Barna, a Christian pollster. The Bible says this, Faith comes from hearing the message, and the message is heard through the Word of God. So God has preserved this book for all these years for you and me to read, to learn how we can live purposeful lives to learn how we can learn about Jesus and salvation and a life that is to come. God's preserved this. There was a book with an intriguing title. The title was called this, All That I Ever Learned, or All That I Ever Needed to Know, I Learned in Kindergarten. And you know, there's a truth in which if we go to the preschool department, even in this church, everything that we need to know for salvation, we can probably learn in that department. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. And that's the truth that God would have us to know. When we're facing that dark world out there and people are saying, there's no truth out there to be found, there's truth to be found in God's holy word if we would read it and study it and believe it. And this is what we believe in this New Testament church, the Oasis, that this is God's authority for our life. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for the scriptures. We thank you and believe that you are all powerful, that you are able to keep the Old Testament scriptures together, that you are able to bring about the New Testament scriptures as you guided the hand of those Bible writers and that you've got it packed up in this holy Bible that we call scriptures today, that there's a very good reason that we ha have it intact the way that it is. I pray, Father, as a people of faith, if we didn't have this, what would we have? If we didn't believe in the church, what would we believe in? Father, I pray that we can understand that you do have the answers, that you do have the will for my life, pen in these words. I pray, Father, that we would find answers today. I pray that if there's anyone here today hasn't taken that next step of faith and belief, that they would do that today, that they would understand that your word is truth, that Jesus is the way of salvation, and they would accept that fact and receive your gift today. I pray that if anyone has never taken that next step and, and had all their sins washed away, I pray that they would make that decision to do so today. I pray that they could come into the back in just a moment. If anybody has any questions, maybe they've been a Christian for a long time and they think, you know what, I've really not followed this book like I should. I want somebody to pray with me to go to you, oh God, together with somebody and pray and say, God, lift me up out of this quagmire. I pray, oh God, that we could seek to be a church that would lift each other up to help things be okay because your spirit will guide us and protect us. In your power, I pray.